First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, this is the title, but there was actually a subtitle to it, which I cut, but then thought so maybe I should put that in to sort of set the mood. So that's the title, and that's the subtitle. And so I guess we have to make it for Stone. Please wait till the end. But uh, then let's see what's happening. So, the spoiler code, free code. What's actually happening? What is this? This is not boiler code, this is not boiler free uh, code. I can turn ref. What is actually going on here? This is not nice. I don't want this. I, like, Attila earlier said that he understood what the turn ref was doing. I'm still not there. Like, and I'm sort of your average user here, so no. Um, just from the syntax, it's just it's too much. Like, I don't want to deal with this, and I bet. Many people also will not do want to deal with it. And then Dennis told us many things that are to come, bug fixes, issues still existing, and we're not done. And so one of the things I think is actually happening here is actually not like this one thousand is not the problem. I think the problem is that we think that D is the successor to C and C plus plus. And that is not true. That battle is over. Rust has won. We don't have to fight that fight. It's not our fight. It's over. Like, Rust has won. But there's still enough space for D to live and to live great and have like a long lasting thing that when you're all 70 or older, we can still come to become and talk to each other how great the 2020 was. So, and also, we think that safe languages or memory safe languages are a new thing. They are not. Most languages are memory safe. Take Python, take JavaScript, take Java. They're all memory safe. We are not doing something new here. Rust is not doing something new here. It's all boring and already exists. And to maybe get the point across a bit better, I think this will happen in the previous time. And then, well, this is where we are going to be. But nobody's going to care. It's Rust, and we are actually second place already. Why do we have to do something else? And obviously, we have done quite a few things. And I'm going to maybe sort of give a dis different perspective on how we can actually live in this space and have everything we wanted. And also have stack memory, because stack memory is awesome. And then it's right. I mean, like, if you can't do global, do stack. So luckily, at this point, there are still some people around here. So I can continue without talking to myself in the empty room which is pretty good stuff. So let's have a look. Again, what is this? All those rules, I still don't get it. Why do I have to care? I just want to get my job done and actually understand the problem that I should solve with the programming language as a tool. Like, I don't care about the memory. It just shouldn't break. So let's take a step back and think about this. Did 1000, did 1021, I think, was the number, did uh, 1035, all those things add syntax and semantics to the language. But what if we remove some stuff and take a different perspective? So let's just say we take old school state and then we make the unary and operator an error. We remove that from the grammar so you can't take the address of the stack. And also, we disallow returning via REST. And also, we don't allow to slide static array. Let's see what happens. So, what I think are the consequences of those choices is we don't need this 1000 and all that to get workable phase D. So, at phase, at the old standard. Also, um, we get quite a few other things. One negative thing might be uh, we won't get user-defined safe containers as that build that behave like those in types like an array or an associative array. Also, there's going to be no manual memory management in, in safe code anymore, which I think is fine because the stack for most part is perfect. Also, or probably most of you forgot, we're going to get a clear definition of property because there's some interesting fixes in there where yes, stuff behaves differently when you take the address. And a few other things which we can't get into because, like, I only have 45 minutes. So, let's see what the consequences are in practice and what we maybe can do to remedy those. One of the things that quite often you do is you have some local D in this case, 
you take the address, pass it to a function. Then you have to do some dip on thousand stuff and annotate that. How can we actually work against this? Well, quite simple. D already has everything we need. Instead of passing a pointer, pass a rec. And we don't even have to take the address. The assembly at the end will be the same. The optimizer will do the same. And we don't have to anything to the language. And it's safe, and you can do it right now. You don't get any application messages. You don't have to curse even. And other things, if you want to pass data up, we actually, so the old style is you pass the pointer and you then have to do scope. But we have an out keyword. You can just do this. And it's obvious to even the novice what is going on there. You just return the data, you don't have to take the address. It's obvious what's happening. And for containers, everybody wants usually find containers that do manual memory management that behave like buildings. But even D can't do that. This is a hack in the compiler. It's turning a const int array into an array of const int. This works in D, but it's pretty much a hack in the compiler. So we are asking for something that D itself can't really do. Maybe we shouldn't ask for it or realize that we're not going to get it. But that's not a problem because there are remedies to this to make code easy and understandable. So let's say we want to build our own container that stores data. So this one here is quite simple. We have like an array struct that has a static array in type that actually stores the data. What you would normally do is on op index, you return a rest to the element. Fair enough. But then you can have a situation like this where you have a main function that calls the function that has that container that is that's living on the stack. And we turn the rest from the function and then take the address of it. The stack as then is uh, illustrated so nicely has gone away and we are in a situation where we have non memory state code. But as I said earlier, what if we disallow returning the rest? Uh, what would you do instead? So, one possibility instead of using op index, you have a function called get, you pass in the index, and you pass in the out parameter to do the same. And here already you can see the new code, even though this cut up at the bottom, is safe. A is going to be fine even after fun returns. So, quite simple again, instead of returning, we pass the memory into which we want to write via a function parameter. But still, this code. It's not quite perfect. You could still be out of bounds, and we're going to get to that um, a bit later as well. So, an even nicer thing to do is we have a nullable type in the standard library. So, what if we pass that in and then check if our index is still in the bounds, and if that is the case, we actually write into the nullable, meaning that by the time we get back to uh, main or after line 25 here, we can actually check if there is a value in the nullable. If the process is defined, there's no way this is going to lead, except maybe that nullable is doing something very crazy, but then I guess we as developers of the language and library has, have screwed this one up uh, ourselves at some point in the past. But it's there already. We don't need new syntax to do this. And even the news of novices will quite easily understand what is going on here and doesn't have to listen to a very well uh, made presentation of a hundred whatnot slides to do what go rest did whatever it does. It's just it's there already. Why make it more complicated? So this is the nice thing that I sort of got to while working on this. Show of hands. What is the type of pointer here? Is it a pointer to the uh, property function? Or is it a, so is it a pointer to the property function? Is it a pointer to the value returned by the property function? Yeah. I think somebody raised their hand twice. Actually, I think you're all wrong. This could be a syntax error. You're not allowed to take the address, period. That is a message a novice will understand. Or I will understand if I'm tired. You can't. It's a syntax error. Very easy. Another example. Let's not be smart. I sort of try to test here that it's actually returning into a main parameter, but what happens when I pass this RDC and uh, enable optimization, 
the whole function sun disappeared, uniform disappeared. All it did was basically filling up the array in the main function with the decode and making it really quick. If I started fiddling around with passing the data via a pointer or wrap into this, like I'm quite sure at some point the LDC optimizer would have said, yeah, I'm not sure what you're doing here. It seems sketchy. I'm just going to opt out and do sort of the, the boring code generation. Make it simple. Make it easy. Um, who remembers this guy? Okay, so for, for the younger people around you, this is Scott Myers. And him, uh, Andre Alexandrescu, and Herb Sutter, those are basically the C++ gods. They told us for decades how to do C++. And he gave a very interesting presentation in 2014. Anybody remember what he said in the end, the last sentence? Ali? The last thing he needs is a person like me. Exactly. The last thing he needs is a person like him. And I would argue that person for DIP 1000, that's Dennis. And that's just one part of the language. We haven't talked about templates yet. And all the other stuff. Like, and he was, I think he's still right, and this has been nearly 10 years ago when he said it. And we are going down that route quickly. Maybe Dennis wants to be that person, then he's doing a great job. But I think he wants to do other stuff as well. So uh, maybe not, not, let's not go down that route. And coming from that, there are other things that we have done that make the language difficult to get into, difficult to reason about at scale, and in general, difficult to use successfully. So, a very nice class for the search, having one member, an int, and it's set to 1000. We compile it, and the main function creates an instance of that class, and then, so on the command line, we want to see what the value, the return value of the main is. What do you guys think if we compile it with those parameters, what the return value is? Yeah, exactly. But that's like ludicrous if you think about it. So what is happening here, there's an invariant to the class, and basically the meaning behind that is before every member call and after every member call, the body of the invariant is executed. And here it says A has to be unequal to zero, which is obviously true because we never set A, or we never set A to anything other than 1,000. And also in the uh, member function sum that we call, we, in the in contract check if it's unequal to zero, uh, the out parameter we check if it's unequal to zero, and the body doesn't return anything, it's just saying it's still false. We could definitely throw. And then also, we check that the return value from fun, which is at the definition here, nothing, should be unequal from zero, and then we just return it. So what happens? A nice small parameter passed to the compiler, which is called release. Obviously, all of you know what's happening, that, that the novice who's are coming to the language and looking for something new will not understand this. And the problem here is that release is basically removing all invariants, all assert, and all contracts. So basically, those features in anything other than unit test block or for DBL fighting purposes becomes null and void. We cannot use that. Or we remove the release flag, but then people say, oh, but then our benchmarks are under class because we don't do bound check. Yeah? A cert false is still in there, even with releasing it. But I don't see the error. I mean, I tried to should. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is the point, right? Like, three very experienced key developers here were having different opinions on what is supposed to happen. But how does the regular user coming from TypeScript is going to feel about this. He's going to not going to take a second, but he's going to go to Go or to Rust or to any other language. This is too complicated. He can't do this. So, my suggestion, don't use any assert, don't use, well, let me rephrase that. Don't use any asserts in anything other than unit test block, invariant and contract stuff pretty much. Don't use them. Just doesn't make sense. Because you can't be sure how your code is compiled with what parameters. So, as I said, another thing, template constraints. I, all, I know all of you love them. I love them. But it's ludicrous. This is 
well, taken from Phobos and stripped out. And I think index off is one of the nicer usages of the uh, template constraints. So we have an index off function, which basically returns the estimate to just an index to a needle found in the haystack. And here it's specifically for strings. But because there are different prototypes for the function, so you can search for substrings or for characters, and you can not only search in a string but also in a range, we have to basically do the overloading for the templates with constraints, and this is done here with the if statement. And the first two are quite simple. The first thing is we test if it's a range and that the element type of the range is a character, and then we also test that the thing that is passed in is not a string. On the second one, we just test that the thing that is passed in or that the uh, character C here or the thing C is a character. And that works because then it matches strings because strings are just like a race of characters. But then there are more things. So we have like the case and specific parameter, we have the start index parameter, and we have to basically do like a constraint that is true for this one function that we actually want to implement, but it's false for all the others. And it just scales terribly. And it even continues even more. There are more functions. And then after we have done the initial checking, we pass it on to the actual implementation because those have to be different for ranges and for strings. Because for ranges, you can't slice them if you have a start index and so on and so forth. It just becomes like this becomes difficult to understand. And obviously, the sort of growing scope of the project, you have to add new stuff, and it goes on and goes on. And then half a year later, you're looking at this, like, what is going on here? Like, I need to write out all those uh, it or template constraints to make heads or tails out of it. And I found that I had, like, long practice just printing out one or the other, the Boolean values, and trying to understand what's going on here. And I think that I know where this is coming from. So got in the good old days when C++ didn't have const expert, they had something like this. And the acronym, if I get it right, please correct me if I got it wrong, is substitution failure is not an error, it's cleaner. I think I agree, but I must be right. And in main here, we want to compute the Fibonacci number for the value 10 and want n want to return this. So how this works is the template parameter is passed basically either as a name as in the first template of Fibonacci, but also you have different declaration of the template where you instantiate that value. And here we have two instantiations, basically for the recursion anchor for 0 and 1. And then what happens in the first template from minus 4 and 5, we take the value that is known as compile time and instantiate that for nested template instantiations of the same template. And eventually, by subtracting one, we're going to get to the place where we either match the zero case or the one case. And I think this was, like, the position is so close to where template constraints with the if keyword goes. I think this is the route where this is coming from. Water hopefully knows or hopefully has forgotten. But anyway, this is uh, this is so close that I think it's right, and for the purposes here, as I'm on stage, this is the place where this is coming from. And this was already, when I first saw this as a young student, I was like, this is magic, but that is dark magic. But please not do this. So, how to make this less terrible? One obvious thing is, bundle all the parameters in the struct and pass them in. And then what you do, only having one template implementation here is check your different varieties of inputs at inside of the body itself. So all we're interested here is to say, is the element type of the range a character? And if that's not a case, you're going to static assert and print a nice error message. And then inside what we do is we basically do a jump depending on the types that we get. And with static if, that becomes nice. We have like an implementation function for ranges, and we have an implementation uh, function for strings, and we can test them separately, and we know how the code is flowing. Um, and here, sort of the nice trick about that is, if you don't have any parameters, you just sort of take the inner value of the struct and pass that in. And um, 
and it's easy to understand. There's one place from where all the dispatching is happening, and it just works, and it's easy to understand. Another way to do this, uh, which is a tiny bit more tricky, but might be also interesting for, for people, if you don't want to construct the parameter uh, structure instance and pass that is do something like this. So you always need our haystack and our needle, but also we might have additional arguments. And one thing that you could very easily do is you have a static for each of the members of the parameter struct, and then uh, you have to do a tiny bit of template magic to unpack that because the structure is containing, uh, as seen here, nullables uh, for the dot index and the nullable for the uh, case sensitivity. So we use the unpack template to get sort of the base type of the nullable and then check if it's equal to the type uh, of the argument that we're currently creating. And if that is the case, we assign it to the index of parameter struct and move on. Obviously, this is one gigantic drawback, which is that you cannot have two parameters of the same type. But I would argue uh, for most functions, that is something that you should desire in any case, because what will happen is if you have two parameters that have the same type, and uh, not behold, they are uh, just behind each other, so let's say index one and index two for the parameters, people will mix them up. And you're going to see an example of that later. So this might also be an option. And in this way, you can just add parameters to your index uh, of parameter struct, and just recompile and it will work. You can just pass stuff in. Um, so, template constraints, don't use them. It's not going to help you. It's just going to make your life miserable. Maybe not now, but in half a year's time, it's going to be hard to understand. So, um, I said I'm, I'm going to try to make any here. Uh, I'm going to suggest to not use other things as well. One of those things is nested functions. Uh, pardon my French, I think they're not good. And I wanted to say another word, but I then just remember that Michael has to bleep those words out for the YouTube upload, and uh, last time he had to bleep something else. So, they are not good. And... Uh, Walter had a nice statement many years back which said uh, nested functions are good replacement for go-tos. And I'm like, that's like putting lipstick on a pig. Like, it's still a go-to, but it's not called that. So, let's not do this. One of the major problems with this is the uh, internal to string function, that is, or the nested one, uh, defined on line 4, you don't actually, if the function gets bigger, it's going to be very hard to figure out from where the parameters that it's using are coming from. So the appender here is declared at the beginning of the two string function. And if this function no longer, it's probably very hard to know where it is. And then also you have uh, variable shuttering. So if you ever have like another appender that is local to this, it's going to be even bit more difficult. And also the internal to string function is dependent on an index that is, uh, well, packed in the the outside function, so to speak. And it's just not worth it. What you do is you pull it out, you make it private, you pass all the parameters in, you write a unit test for it, and then you forget it and it just works. This is just making your life more difficult. No method function. Um, yeah, what is also very bad, and I said I'm going to ha I have something for everybody here, method import is just not helping you. So, you're going to have a two-string function. It's going to import std uh, comp at some point to use the two symbol to convert the actual value to a string. And then you have another one somewhere, and you're going to do the same for double, and you import the thing. And then you have many others. And also, what you do if the method in, or if the function is taking a parameter of type that is not defined in your uh, in the model that you're currently uh, working on, the nested imports will be split to some global imports and some nested imports. Have them all global. If you want to refactor, you take all the imports, you take the function, and then use the awesome script that uh, Rust and started to filter out unnested imports. And it's going to wither that down. And quite quickly, you have a small module with a few functions that only have the import that you actually need. To do this is just making your life 
more difficult than just the rest of the year. If you have a phone or a tablet, for example, if you're a library guy, so you have a lot of content, uh, it might be better for performance if you put your imports inside the template and just to put all of the imports at the uh, global code. Fair enough. Um, I would say the same thing I say to Walter pretty much on every uh, foundation meeting, the compiler is too slow. I think as a user, I shouldn't have to care. I should have to, I should write the code that is easy for me to write in the first place, refactor, and then change over time and distribute. I guess the comp, like, why, uh, why do I as a, as a user have to care how, which imports are faster than others? So, as I said, so let's sort of get to the end. And I think this is where, like, why I ask you to all keep your stones and your tomatoes in your pockets for now. So, I think scope, rest, return, all those are good things. And I'm 100% sure that Dennis and Walter and others will eventually have something that is sound and correct and working and understand it and document it correctly. I 100, I'm 100% sure. Like, I might not be able to understand it, but if I were smarter, I bet I would be. But not in state code. I think Andre once said when there was discussion about deleting the delete keyword, it's like you have to have a toilet if you don't put it in your living room. I don't need this in state code. State code should be simple and safe. And I think by removing stuff, we can get to that place a lot easier than we can uh, get to there by adding stuff to the language that makes it more complicated. And there's sort of an interesting thing I read yesterday. Rust had a gigantic survey with over 10,000 participants. And the biggest complaint that Rust users had was that Rust was too complicated. And I'm 100% sure that he without dip 1000 is already a lot more complicated than Rust. So, I don't want people to use Rust or Go. I want, I want this crowd to be so big that I actually have to hurry to buy a weekend ticket that I get a seat. And uh, I think by making the language more complicated, we're not going to get there. So, maybe a suggestion to not get stoned later on here. Dip 1000 work, I think, should move to Trusted. Trusted is sort of, at least in my opinion, just sort of a bastard child between safe and system code. It does nothing else than being callable from safe and then calling system. But in it, well, the name is a bit wrong at that point. We don't really trust to verify it at all, but I think those mechanisms should live there and safe should be simple and you shouldn't be able to take the address, you shouldn't be able to spice the data array, and you shouldn't be able to return the array. And for all the other stuff, you ain't going to need it. I guess you want high-performance code, as Dennis already mentioned, turn it into an array and iterate over it from front to back, because that's what traffic cards are doing, this is what SIMD code is doing. And if you are too smart, the compiler will not be able to follow, or the optimizer will not be able to follow you. You ain't going to need it. Make it simple and understandable. And then, sort of finally, to say, simple is better than complicated. And I think we should Think about what Scott said nearly 10 years ago. Every time we propose a new feature or want to build a library or build a new API, simple is better. Oh, and as uh, Ethan hasn't shown me the time yet, I have one more thing to say. So, a small appendix. Please don't add tuples. My favorite examples by tuples are just the wrong idea. Assuming you have a GPS function that returns a tuple longitude and latitude, and in main you assign that to latitude and longitude, and your airplane will do as it did yesterday over our Great Britain. It's not going to make it here. So, thank you. I want, I want to congratulate you on some original thinking, things I've never thought of. And I, I'm really intrigued by your idea of altering the meaning of space to be more of a subset. 
And what I encourage everyone here to do is to try it out. Try using uh, his suggestions when writing safe code of avoiding uh, uh, pointers and stuff like that. And you know, let's get some real world uh, experience here from it. And uh, I'm really interested to see how it turns out. How far can we go with this? I mean, from my own personal experience, you get nice, boring code that is sort of doing the expected thing. And like when you come back half a year later and you think, who wrote this? And then you look at your blame and, oh, it was me. Yeah, makes sense. Nice and boring. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm going to try it myself. Yeah, it is. And see how far they go. And I encourage you all to do it too. And uh, let's see if we can make this work. Yeah. And the really cool thing about not taking the address it's the user choice in most cases, and also returning direct and slicing the race. There's no, there's nothing that DMD has to do to help you. You can write this code right now. It's just sort of that you have to remember not to take the address. If there's anything you want to take away, don't take the address. It's not going to end it. Yeah, we need D as a library to write a linter that says don't take the address. So where's, where's the young and where's the young? <laughs> yeah, you can Cool. Okay, first of all, that was unbelievably based, so of course you are commonly wrong the next countries. And again? <laughs> no, actually, um, I just want to confirm we've been writing like a uh, user facing or like domain code without pointers for years and years. And that's really good. Like all the pointers you have is in deep and frameworks that are really using just the anyway. So, uh, as an addendum about Poopers, uh, you probably not going to have a Poopers, you probably that you have Poopers with our names on the field. Actually, it's like the name of the names and there was actually checked by the title system that they couldn't happen. Yeah. yeah. And I sort of skipped over the part where we already have the Poopers files in D. And if you really want to put yourself in the foot and send any longitude and latitude, you can already do that. So, I don't think you have to put that into a language to do a mistake. We can already do, do the mistake. Um, I want to echo what was saying that some of the ideas are really good. Um, in fact, before you showed the last slide saying we could be pretty impressive, they went, I think we could do that impressive. So, um, very interesting. Uh, but I also want to uh, echo the previous question. You were terribly wrong about a bunch of other stuff. And just to echo uh, what I said many times last year, it was one time. That's all someone else will say, right? I just want to say again. Uh, any more questions? Yes? Hey, I've got a question for you, Dennis, while you've got the microphone. How do you feel about that tool? Yeah, I don't think with my own code, it would be able to like, use your idea of rep, you know, like strings and static arrays with the size. They don't prefer to the great of knowledge size. So, I'll have to try it out. As for my question, so as you said, as a user, you just want to write nice looking code. And you showed an example of accessing an array with get and out parameter, but what if the user says, I don't want that, I just want to use a nice looking index operator? Yeah, but like. Can we get That's unfortunate. Yeah, like obviously you want nice code, but you also want correct code, and I hope, or I'm pretty sure, that you want correct code over nice code. Okay. All right, do we have any more questions? On where are all the tomatoes? Uh, one, one thing I, I noticed in your uh, presentation in your examples was like, knowledge was pretty important. Uh, would you, what would you think about like having special knowledge type things like I don't like it. I've, I've done quite a bit of TypeScript now. And it, it's pervasive. It sort of gets everywhere, even if you don't really want to. So I would say the knowledgeable type, as it's right now, is partly in the way that you don't want to use it. And that helps you to structure the code so that you don't, you don't go for that. Like you try to make it not with knowledgeable. So, um, yeah, I would say 
at the bottom line not to have that in the language. And that also comes back to the point that I wanted to make. Simple is better than difficult. Like the language in itself is already complicated. And if we have a knowledge type that is inbuilt, it's just going to get more complicated. And as Simon so nicely showed, it's already, the types are already so complicated that I have a lot better chance of understanding good 1000 than I have the actual type system. I'm curious. Uh, <clears throat> I don't like the sort of thinking of Mr. Thompson. <laughs> Think that there are other candidates, and I'm curious to know what do you think about things like now, complex mixings, uh, say at the beginning of a file or private or stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, the list I sort of threw uh, is definitely not lost. I mean, ADS just comes to mind, that's like the first thing to go, right? But there's only so much I can rant about in 45 minutes. Like maybe you wait for next year, or for lightning talk, and it can give you a list of things not to do, to pull it point, and then I'm going to run out of time there as well. Yeah, still picking the message function is like, yeah, like, I don't know, I just have a hate for them. Right, what can I say? Right, uh, I think we're done with questions, so uh, thanks again, Robert. Sure.